on Facebook the next moment. Pilar, I remember you too. Yes. Hi, Pierre. Hello, Hi. Pilar. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The live stream is working. Yeah, looks like more people are coming in. We're still also waiting for uh, Georgios Kasi. Ah, there he is. Georgios is entering the group too. Georgios Kasianos. Calimero Georgios, nice to see you. And another good there. friend is coming in, Niels Toase from. Luxembourg. Hello, Niels. So we're now already online uh, on all the sites I mentioned, and people are also watching already on Facebook what we're doing. And another friend is coming in from Slovenia. My friend Valentin. Okay. Georges, I think we could, ah, wait, just a sh short moment for our friend uh, Nina from Denmark. Okay. I think we could start now. If more people are coming in, they can uh, just join. That's no problem. Um, George, do you want to say a few words uh, to start to, yeah, just welcome the people? Well, it's great to see all of you. My God, we have from uh, all corners of the world, sommeliers. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Mark, thank you for accepting our invitation. Per, thank you for the cooperation uh, with, the, with the German Association. It's great to have Mark Almer talking about what we believe is uh, uh, it's a very important lecture on how to prepare uh, for competition. And uh, if any of us, have, any of you has read uh, Gerard Basset's latest book, you will see how hard it is to prepare for competition, what methodology he was using. But uh, I'm sure Mark uh, will enlighten us even more on how, uh, you know, young sommeliers can prepare for competition. So I think uh, uh, the stage is yours, Mark, to begin with the, um, with the webinar. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, I think we can start, Mark. Yeah? Okay, very welcome, Mark. You have the word. Ah, okay. Now try it again. Thank you, Pierre, for unmuting me. Um, and hello to everybody from around the world. And first of all, Ifaristo Parapoli to the colleagues from Cyprus that have organized this great event. Um, I'm really, really happy to see very many familiar faces from different corners of the world, many of which I had the great honor to uh, train and compete with uh, in the previous years but also had um, the chance now to meet many new people, both here in Zoom and live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, what's the idea for today? I didn't prepare a presentation because it's quite a personal topic, so I'll be talking, so I hope that's okay for you. Um, and I'll be telling you how I prepared for the several competitions I did, um, what I think are some tips and tricks you can use when you prepare for different kinds of sommelier competitions, and that will take about the first half of the session. And then afterwards, I'm really curious to hear all the kinds of questions you have. And please, if there are any questions that you come uh, up with during the session, please feel free to write them in the chat. And then Pierre and I will address them later. Um, what will we be speaking about and what not? We will not be going into the details of practical exams because that would um, uh, be too much for this small session. So we were speaking more about how to structure preparation, what to look into, and especially what separates the preparation from a sommelier competition to that of a sommelier exam like the MS or the MW or any other sommelier exam. And with that, I would like to start. 
And I think the most important thing to understand when you enter a sommelier competition is what it is, specifically which competition you're entering, and the second one, um, what's your aim in it. And I would like to start by explaining why I entered sommelier competitions, because I was working as a young sommelier in the Rheingau um, and had great fun. And then my boss became quite stern and said, it's good that you're enjoying your job, but you need to become a bit more serious about it. Um, and you need to do a sommelier exam. So uh, I decided to go down the track of the Court of Master Sommeliers and looking at the introductory and certified exams. Um, and I thought, well, it might be a bit bad to be in that stressful situation on the first day on exam day. So why not do a sommelier competition? Um, so I ended up doing a young sommelier competition by the Chaine du Rotisseur um, and had great help with preparing. And then when I did that, it was like the first kick for a drug addict. I was really hooked. Um, because it was so much fun to do that and I wanted to continue. Um, and why did I want to continue? There were two main reasons. The first one is I think everything you learn while you are preparing for a sommelier competition will then help you in your everyday job in your restaurant, which I think is the key thing of every sommelier to work in a restaurant or in a different environment where he sells wine um, and other beverages and to continue improving his skills no matter where in his life he is. The second part was, um, thanks to that young Somnia competition, which I then re-entered the following year, I had a chance to go to Adelaide um, and meet a lot of great contestants from all over the world. And it was a bit like um, a very young fish being uh, thrown into a very deep pond and having to swim, because suddenly there were very many candidates that had things like flashcard apps on their phones. And I was completely baffled and to which skill or level you can take um, Somnia competition preparation. And that's what's been really the highlight for me throughout the competitions I did was to keep meeting people from all over the world and having a chance to um, engage with them and uh, learning from them and building friendships that last uh, beyond the competition day or week itself. The second thing to consider when you enter a competition is not only why you are doing it, but what are you prepared to do for it? Because um, every competition um, will be very stressful especially the high level competitions like the ASI, best sommeliers of continents or uh, the world, uh, will require a lot of sacrifice from you in your personal life, which means you will probably leading up to it, not sleep as much as you used to, spend a little less time with your family and friends than before and spend a lot of your free time revising theory, traveling to train, um, watching things online and tasting, 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 tasting. And that is why it's very important to have an intrinsic motivation to do that, to make sure you have a goal, which is um, that you really want to do this and you really want to become a better sommelier. Because if something somebody has forced onto you, uh, then probably it will not be successful and it will be quite a strain. So it's very important to have that motivation to keep pushing and keep going uh, to do it because it can be a year long process as we have seen with great idols like uh, Gérard Basset who um, collected very many accolades in his life, but actually his best summary of the world title was one of the late last he actually took um, and he had to enter the competition quite a lot of times. And that's why it's important, it really needs to be something you enjoy. And to make sure you enjoy it, it's something to understand you can't do on your own. Um, and you need to have a team, let's say, surrounding you that helps you uh, prepare. And I was very grateful that I had a very strong team, both in my private life, but also in my professional life. Actually, my restaurant manager is here with us today, Aurélien Blanc, who is the uh, best sommelier of Switzerland. And while he was training for that, I was training for the best sommelier of Germany. So we helped a lot each other. And after service, we would go each other blind tasting flights. We would um, speak about new legislations that have passed, like, for example, recently the DAC Wachau. Um, so there was a lot of understanding there and a lot of coaching. But at the same time, because I wasn't part of a good restaurant team, I also had the chance to travel. And especially the German Sommelier Association today, represented by Per Holm, um, helped me a lot to prepare. Um, I had a personal coach, a master sommelier called Frank Kemmer, who came second in the best sommelier of Europe and Africa competition once. Um, and there were international programs like SOM360 in Canada, which is open to um, anyone who applies for a scholarship. Um, and other things like watching competitions. And the good thing about training in the central of Europe is you meet a lot of other candidates. For example, I was constantly training with the best sommelier of South Africa, Joe Wessels. Um, and to have that kind of team, to have that kind of WhatsApp group and email link where you keep sending information back and forth is something that's uh, immensely helpful and something I can really recommend because it's uh, such a big task that it's impossible to do on your own. 
And of course, it helps if your family and friends are up for it too. For example, when I would come home from my dinner service at the restaurant, there would be on my uh, table at home five glasses of spirits with a paper on them uh, that were pre-poured by somebody. And I would have to then smell and identify it and turn over a sheet of paper to see whether I was right. So it really is a daily process. And that's very, very important. Once you're done, you made your decision to enter a sommelier competition, especially if it's a high level sommelier competition, I recommend doing every possible competition you can. It's a bit different, of course, in every country, but in many, many countries, you have a myriad of sommelier competitions offered in a two or three year cycle. Um, there can be quite small competitions like the Ruina Tasting Challenge, which is only about blind tasting. They can be focused just on one country, like um, the Wines of South Africa competition or the Wines of Spain and Germany competitions, which are held in many countries. Or they can be um, a bit more open to a certain age group, like a young sommelier competition. And things like that are very important to constantly stay in this training mode and to constantly be in that stressful situation and also to learn about your own routine. So uh, at the peak of times, I was doing something like three to five sommelier competitions a year. And of course, not all of them are successful, but in every one you learn, maybe you weren't on your best form on that day. Maybe you had struggles with the decanting exercise, or maybe the theory paper was written in a way you didn't see before. And then you will learn how to improve and become better at um, certain parts of the process. And the key thing to remember is a competition is different from an exam. A competition, especially in terms of theory, will be set on a high level that it's almost impossible for any candidate to know everything in this paper or in this question. And that's why it's very important to understand if you're preparing for an international sommelier competition, nothing is irrelevant. Um, you have to remember that the exam is set up in a way that almost for every candidate in the room, there will be a question from his country. And of course, if there's a French sommelier, then it's probably going to be something about French wines or spirits, which we all know. But if it's a sommelier from Southeast Asia or from a country which is not a well-known wine producing country, there might be something on a beer, a coffee, tea or history related to that country. And that's why it's very important to keep a very vast mind and to really look into what do I have to know. And this will greatly differ from the competition. If it is a big one, then anything can come up. And that's quite sadly the truth. So you need to be a bit of a gambler and see which part you invest more time in. Whereas if it's a very narrow competition, like just on one country or just on one style of wine, then you should really go deep into the rabbit hole and look at everything you can find about that wine country, taste everything you can. And that's really important to find out what's this competition about. And of course, the judges can't tell you that, but most of these competitions have happened before. And so if you have any chance through Facebook, through personal connections, to reach out to candidates that have been in that same spot, have been through that competition, and maybe have written down one or two questions which they remember from the last time, reach out to them, ask them. They will most likely be very happy to share their information and tell you what things to watch out for. And that's very, very important looking into what is specific about this competition. That also includes looking at who is organizing the competition, what are the sponsors involved, um, and where will the next edition of the competition be? For example, those of you that were with us in Antwerp, um, there were very many questions on Cyprus. Why? Because the next big sommelier contest of Cyprus is this, uh, of the ASI is this November in Cyprus. So already in the World Cup 2019, there was a lot of questions on um, commanderie and other beverages from Cyprus. And there was also one in the blind tasting. And that's why it's important to take quite a big scope. To make sure you don't miss out on anything, I always recommend backing that up with several media. That means you should look perhaps at the syllabus, which is uh, public as a PDF on the side of the Court of Mass Assemblies, both of the Europe's and the Americas. Um, you should maybe buy one of the WSET books to see what they are looking into, both on wines and on spirits. You should perhaps invest $100 in a year in Guildsom, which is a great website I can really recommend because at a fingertip, you have the entire wine world with all its legislations, uh, many cocktail recipes, many interesting discussions and podcasts. So that's really worth looking up. Um, and you should also stay current. That means you should be looking into um, either electronically getting newsletters from Mining as Wine Business International, 
um, or getting printed magazines like Decanter, like Wine Spectator, like the World of Fine Wine to find out what's happening because it's very, very important that you um, stay on top of the game and notice if someone is selling an estate, buying an estate, if a famous vintner sadly passed away, um, if there's a new legislation like a new region or a new quality level being launched. And because um, if you always have to remember the examiner who's writing the exam probably has written many exams in his life. And he, of course, wants to keep changing that too. So if he currently read that in Spain, you now have Cava, you now have Corpinat and many other sparkling wine producer associations, that might be something he says, okay, that's all over the news. I expect candidates to know that. So I put it in my paper. So that's something you should keep a list of um, what's happened in the last one or two years and keep going back to old flashcards and old texts you might have done for yourself um, to really make sure you didn't miss anything. And because it's so much, I really recommend that you build yourself a timetable leading up to the time of your competition that you say, okay, in this week, I'm going to do this. And this week, I'm going to do this to make sure you plan your time ahead and make sure also you don't procrastinate because I'm someone, if I don't have a time pressure, I always like to say, hmm, maybe I could do this tomorrow. Maybe I could do this the day after tomorrow. And then suddenly you only have two or three days left and then you start to panic. And that's why it's important to make yourself a timetable, which also includes break times. Make sure you have at least one or two days a week where you are relaxing and spending time with the family and sleeping enough and uh, just enjoying a bottle of wine without writing a tasting note. And I think that's the general scope of what needs to be done when you prepare for a competition. Having said that, now I would like to look at um, four different key pillars when preparing for sommelier competition and go into a bit more detail. Um, and that is, of course, tasting, theory, service, but, and that's very, very often forgotten, the fourth one, which to me is just as important, is the mental preparation and the physical preparation. And we will now look into those four separate pillars. We will start by theory. Why? Because theory is probably the one that will steal most of your time. It's probably going to be the one which is hardest to motivate um, and is the one which is the most vast, especially if you're learning for an international competition. Why is that? In a theory paper, you can literally have anything thrown at you. Um, and that can be wine, of course, but any other beverages, then current knowledge, like we just spoke about, and then other things like um, sales pitches, tasting notes, uh, menu recommendations, pictures. And for me, the first time since I left school, I had to write an essay was in Antwerp in March 2019, when suddenly we opened the semi-final paper and there was, please write an essay and discuss what makes a good sommelier. For first time in 12 years, I suddenly was writing an introduction, essay plan, etc. And for that, we had about 10 to 15 minutes. So you need to be quite organized in what you do. I think before you start learning theory, it's important you learn about yourself. What do I mean with that? When you um, have so much theory to learn, it's very easy to have the feeling you're doing something because you read a book, because you looked at a flashcard, because you saw a video on YouTube but it doesn't really stick and everybody learns differently. So before you start learning about wine, I really recommend you learn about learning. And there are many, many good websites out there. There are many good apps that help you learn um, best about what learning techniques are out there and which one works for you. For example, many people learn very well with colors by taking a text and highlighting every grape in red, every country in green, every winemaker in blue, I don't work very well with colors. I'm an Excel guy. So for the World Cup, I made myself loads of Excel sheets with all the information I found and kept condensing it. But that might be very different for you. So it's very important that you look into what you uh, need to retain the information best. And of course, to make sure you really understood that, it's important that you um, make sure you test yourself in a regular interval. And that can be by colleagues sending you questions on a certain topics. That can be by a coach giving you an oral exam on one of those topics. That can be by doing online quizzes like in Guildsom to make sure you didn't miss anything. And uh, I really recommend finding a group of peers that are learning the same thing that can either send you questions or also where you can meet up via Skype or Zoom or WhatsApp chat every one or two weeks, maybe 
one week just on one topic and the other week on a general uh, question session to make sure, ah, yes, I learned Sherry, but I forgot to learn all the soils of Sherry, for example, to make sure you keep um, thinking of everything that really is. And of course, for that, also cross-referencing. Look at the Wines of Sherry website, but also look at a classic book, and then maybe look at another website to make sure you didn't really miss anything. And also that way you will see those informations which come up in all two or three sources are probably the most important. And probably those are then the ones you should definitely know. And the rest are those that could come up in a high level of exam or competition. I personally like to learn with flashcards and Excel. So I used a lot of flashcards and there are many great apps out there. Um, there's Cram, there's StudyBlue, there's Anki. Um, and it's important if you use them to make your own flashcards because many of these apps offer the possibility to get a deck from a colleague who has been through the same. And that seems like a great um, savior of time. However, I believe the most important thing you learn when making a flashcard is actually making the flashcard, thinking about what information is important. And uh, you won't learn that if you take a deck from a colleague. So you should make your own flashcards and keep them current. And there, there are two things which are important to remember. One is called spaced repetition. So things you know well, you look at every couple of weeks, things you struggle to remember, you look up every couple of days. And certain apps like Anki will help you do that. Furthermore, the second thing is um, cross-referencing. Let's take the example of Chablis. Uh, we all know Chablis has seven Grand Crus. So you could have a flashcard, tell me the seven Grand Crus of Chablis. Then you could have another flashcard, tell me the seven Grand Crus of Chablis from west to east. Then you could have another flashcard, tell me the seven Grand Crus of Chablis from the smallest to the uh, largest. And that way you have three flashcards which tell you the Grand Crus in different orders. So you will be building more links in your brain that link the same information. But it's proven that that will help you retain this information easier. Some people that are better at drawing than myself also learn very well from maps and tracing papers. So you take that map of Chablis Grand Cru on, next to the river Serra, you put a tracing paper on it and then you paint it on through with a pencil and put it on your wall or on your mirror in the bathroom while you're putting on your makeup. And then you know how to learn that every single day. And that's important to find out what works best for you. And this can be very, very tedious. And there will be very many points where you will feel frustrated and demotivated and don't understand why you have to do this because some topics might appeal more to you. For example, to me, that was always the wines I work with at work. I'm really happy to learn more about them, but some wines I have never seen in my life. Sometimes you have this feeling, mm, why do I need to learn this now? This is not really relevant, but it is because it is part of our world. And that's why it's important to make sure you separate really strong, intense hours where you make flashcards, where you write um, mock exams and have also some slightly more cozy times where you're just reading articles, videos, or listening to podcasts um, and try to mix that amount of energy you need to put in in certain hours with slightly more relaxing hours, focusing on the same topics. And it's really important to remember that it's not only about wine, it's about everything else too. And many people always learn a lot about wine. And in the last two weeks before the competition, they try to learn about spirits, cocktails, beers, all the sakes, all the teas, all the coffees, but that's gonna be very difficult. So you need to make sure when you write your timetable that every day you have a little bit of time to also look at something else than wine, because that definitely will come up. And to me, um, that's very, very important to keep that rotor going. And even if it's a stressful work at week or you're traveling a lot, every day at least do 10 to 15 minutes before you don't do anything at all for a week because this routine of doing something every day or every second day and really staying um, fit in the mind is very important because as soon as you make a longer break you will know that a lot of information will have left your brain already it's a bit like a sportsman um, as someone who wants to go swimming in the olympic games he will swim every day so if you want to become a good sommelier in a competition you need to practice that every single day and uh, like I said, it's important to speak to people that have been to the same kind of competition or if it's online, like for example, the ASI has online some of the questions from last March. Look at those questions and look at what's common. 
I was making myself lists of all the beers, all the coffees, all the waters that had ever been asked in previous competitions that I could find out there or people told me about and then try to remember those because there are so many beers out there. How do you know which ones will come up? You never will know, but you can decrease um, the likelihood of something completely new coming up if you look at what has been out there already. So it's important to really keep that track record of what's happening around the world. So that was theory, the not so fun part. Now comes, I think, the part all of us enjoy most in our free time, tasting. Let's look into that. Um, tasting is probably the most difficult, especially to me, um, because tasting, there's so much that can be, and you have so limited time to make your decision in an exam competition or in a comp sonic competition. For example, in the finals in Antwerp, we had 10 spirits from all over the world, and we only had three minutes to identify them. Uh, for some of the oral tastings, we only had two or three minutes. So it's very, very difficult to score highly in this by getting the right beverages, by identifying it to 100% with the correct vintage quality level and blend. So what's the best thing to do? The best thing to do is to taste as much as possible. Obviously, that's easy in some countries where you have a lot of wine fairs. And if you're living in a big city, probably you have the chance to go to wine tasting much more often. Um, but in some countries, it can be quite difficult because in some countries, you don't have that many wines from all over the world that you might see in a competition. And for that, I strongly recommend to work closely with both your sommelier association, but also with um, maybe your suppliers from the restaurant or with sponsors that are willing to send you those bottles um, to train because many of them will be very happy to assist and many of them will have some leftover tasting bottles which they can then offer to you, especially if you prove to them that you're setting up a small tasting group and not just drinking it on your own, but actually joining together with five or six other sommeliers from around your area and tasting these wines together. And it's very important to do that as often as possible to get some feedback from your colleagues um, and also to get wines you don't know before. At home, I always recommend doing that too, if you have the chance. If not, doing themed flights. For example, you take a Syrah from the Northern Rhone, you take a Shiraz from Barossa, and you take a Shiraz from South, uh, from South Africa and do a flight like that. Then do the same with Chardonnay, do the same with Cabernet, do maybe different vintages from Bordeaux. And of course, that can sound like it becomes very expensive. But again, there, I think as a sommelier, it's important to make sure you don't spend too much money on this. So I would really recommend you to buy a Corava if you can, or ask for it for Christmas, um, because Corava often has special deals for sommeliers, and it's a great way to minimize the costs at home when you're tasting. And that's very important for wine. But again, tasting is also about other things, um, like spirits. And for spirits, it's much easier if you work in a hotel, because then you have a bar. Usually you can taste spirits or just sniff them and put them back. Um, and maybe you can get your colleague, like Aurelien did for me, to always pour you 10 spirits after service and identify them. Um, but maybe you also have a befriended barkeeper you could ask on how to um, organize yourself a tasting flight of spirits. And it's important to really stick to the basics first, differentiating a gin from a whiskey, from a rum, from a Calvados, that kind of thing. And then moving down the rabbit hole of, is it a bourbon, is it an Irish, is it a blended scotch, is it a single malt? That's then the second step. So again, here, building yourself a structure to do it. And it's very, very important to do this with um, every beverages. So also looking at what kind of tasting could come up with tea, because cupping tea is a different kind of structure than wine tasting. And I've been in competitions where, for example, we had to identify tea leaves um, to do that with sake. Um, there's someone here who had to uh, pass a sake flight to win his country, who's laughing now. Um, then there's uh, other beverages like beer. And having known that the competition would be in Belgium, we were expecting um, beer to be a big uh, part. So we spent some time traveling to Belgium, looking at beer breweries with the German Sommelier Association and also meeting with a beer sommelier and having a tasting with him. And that kind of thing is very important. Again, thinking about where is the competition, who are the sponsors, maybe that might be important. And um, sometimes also you can make it fun. I don't know if many of you outside of Europe know this, but uh, in some European countries, you have an advent calendar. So in the 24 days leading up to Christmas, usually there's a box you open and there's a small chocolate. 
the year before the World Cup, I got myself a beer advent calendar. So every morning before work, I would open it, get a bottle of a new beer, put it in the fridge for after work, and then taste a new beer when I came home from after work. And I think it's important to mix those serious elements with a bit of fun too. Very, very, very important when you taste, because it is so difficult to identify things, and especially on wine, work on your structure. Make sure I can wake you in the middle of the night, give you a glass of wine, and you immediately follow the same structure. Why? A sommelier comp contest is always a big stress situation. So when you are in that situation, it needs to be like a muscle memory um, that you know immediately, okay, I need to look at the color, the brightness, the viscosity, the tears, the clarity, etc. And you need to be able to do that in a when you're tired, when you had a bad day, when it's a difficult wine that's not speaking to you at all, you need to always have the same structure to make sure you don't forget anything. And that's very important to practice this both orally, but also written. And that's something that many people forget because when you are in a somni competition, usually in the first stage, it will be a written tasting. And I don't know about you, but I have an awful handwriting. The kitchen always hates me when I write my food orders on a captain order. Um, that's why it's very important before competition to train how to write in a good way because an examiner cannot read what you're writing. He will not give you the points. It's not the benefit of the doubt. If it's not clear that you mean Cabernet Sauvignon and not Cabernet Franc, he might give you a fault even though you wanted to say the good thing. And that's why it's very important to set yourself a timer also a written structure and at home, set yourself a timer for let's say seven minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes to do a full written tasting note with description, with food recommendation, with glasses, all of those things that might be relevant depending on the competition. And I really recommend to get into a habit of doing that because for example, in Antwerp, we had less time for the tasting than in Mendoza. So many candidates really had a time issue in getting their written tasting notes down on paper. So that's really something I would like you to keep uh, on doing every week if you're preparing for a competition. Now comes the part I think all of us enjoy most and was probably the part we decided to become sommelier for, service. Um, and the key thing to remember here is um, service is what we do every day. So there's, it's probably the part in the exam we need to be least afraid of. Why? Because it's the one you can train every day and get paid for. No one will pay you for sitting at home doing flashcards, but if you do a great service in a restaurant, that's our daily job. And I will never forget when I started working here in Zurich, um, my restaurant manager, who's done much more zombie competitions than myself, um, saw me do a couple of things and he said, but would you do it like this in a competition? I said, no, I'm not allowed to. So why are you doing it here? And that really made me change because since then, every bottle of wine I open, I wipe the lip before and after I pour the cork, something I didn't do before. Um, if I'm pouring wines, I try to pour it the same way I would an exam. I try to do it in the same service. Obviously, you need to adapt a little bit to the restaurant environment you are in, but try to do as many of the small things you have to do an exam as often as possible. Try to sometimes set yourself a timer. If you're sent to a table to decant a bottle of wine, look at your watch, do the decanting, come back and look how long you took and think about why did I take so long? Because also at work, you need to be efficient, not only in a sommelier competition. So it's important to remember to um, do the same things, both in the restaurant and in the competition. That also includes smiling, because all of us work in the hospitality industry, and we're here to please our guests and make them happy. And we see very often that people in sommelier competition are so stressed that they're working like robots and have stone faces. And that's not good because we're supposed to show the world how great our job is. And for that, we need to be positive and we need to smile. And probably you will know many of the examiners on stage. So please say, thank you, Mr. Larson. Um, thank you, Mr. Holm. Great to have you here. I hope you enjoy your drink. Do the same things you would do in a restaurant um, because it's really important. We don't want to see robots in competitions. We want to see great sommeliers and great hosts. And that's very, very important to think about that. And one thing, speaking of Andreas Larsson, I would like to share is whoever has been in a competition where Andreas Larsson is judging, before you start the exam, he will give you three tips. And those three tips are listen, listen, and listen. Sounds really obvious, but it's not. What does Andreas mean with this? Um, often in what you get told before you approach a table are very, very many small details you need to pick up. 
because you're nervous, everybody will understand if you ask for repetition of the task. What can be an example? If it's a table of two, there could be the task to serve a bottle of sparkling wine, but it could also be the task of serving a bottle uh, or two glasses of sparkling wine. And if you serve two glasses of sparkling wine and you then leave the bottle at the table, that's probably not a good idea. So it's really important to remember the small details. For example, uh, in Antwerp, we had to serve a bottle of uh, Schloss Vollrats Riesling 2018 Trocken. So they told us the wine, they told us the vintage, and they told us the style. Prepared for us were three bottles from 2017, and only one was trocken, dry. So it's important to have taken that information and immediately look which of these wines is correct. If none is, then that's probably intentionally done, and they're expecting you to say something along the lines of, we don't have this wine anymore, I'm afraid, but I have the even better vintage from the vintage before, or something else to make the guest happy. My coach, Frank Kemmer, always used to say, solve the situation. It's like in a restaurant. If you have a bottle of wine that's warm, then make sure it gets cold somehow, just like you would in a restaurant. Don't overcomplicate things just because you are in a competition. And often think about small traps. For example, in um, Kyoto, uh, two years ago, there was a task about Sancerre. And we all know that Sancerre can be a white Sancerre or red Sancerre. And both bottles were there and they looked very similar. So it was very important to listen to what Serge Lup said, whether he wanted a bottle of the white or the red Sancerre. So it's really, 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 really important to listen to everything they tell you when you do the task. And again, like in a restaurant, walk around with open eyes. Um, for example, it can be that something happens during the task which you can't see coming at the beginning. So if uh, it's important to get a feel for what are classical tasks like decanting or sparkling. And thanks to the gift of YouTube, it's really easy to watch a lot of competitions that have happened before. And there's also a really great tutorial video with Gérard Bassé explaining the different tasks of the World Cup in Mendoza. And if you watch these videos, you will very quickly see common traps like dirty glasses, but you will also see common timings. So you will know that for decanting for four people, they usually will be, let's say, four to five minutes, depending on the competition. So if you come to a table with four guests and they ask you to decant a bottle and tell you you have eight minutes, then you should have your alarm bells ringing because most probably there will be a trap at this table. That means if you take your time to decant for the full eight minutes and then you hear the trap, you will probably not finish the task. But if you do at the same speed, like you train for, for four or five minutes, and then when you're pouring the last red wine, they say, I'd actually like you to uh, make myself a dry martini cocktail now, then you still have the time left to make that dry martini cocktail in the best possible way. And that's why it's a good idea to get a general feeling for timings. The other way around, the quarterfinals in Anfer, we only had two minutes to serve a white wine. That's the moment where, of course, you still try to work elegantly, but the focus is not on elegance. The focus is on serving the wine like in a stressful Saturday night service. If you watch Paolo Basso's final from uh, Tokyo, he tells the audience, I'm really sorry I'm rushing you, but the restaurant is really full today. And he's running around that table to make sure he can finish the task in time. Obviously it should be charming and elegant whenever possible, but some timings will be set very, very, very um, short. And you need to make sure you get everything into that timing that is possible. And again, there, work with open eyes and look at what's prepared. Most of the time when you enter a semi-final or final, this will be announced in the room or on the stage where you will then be doing that semi-final or final. Um, so take the time to look around. Is there a decanting station set up? Is there a cocktail bar set up? What kind of spirits are they if they are not covered? Is there a beer trolley set up? Look, and then when you get pulled to another room to wait until it's your turn, think about, okay, what did I see on stage? How many chairs were there at the table? Um, that kind of thing to really prepare yourself when you come out to know, okay, I'll probably have to go and do this. There will always be surprises and things might change in the meantime, but it's a good idea to take in as many information as you can. For example, there was um, once a competition we did uh, Germany against Austria. And there was a task where we had to pour a sparkling wine. Again, we had quite generous timing. And then the last guest said, I don't like sparkling wine. Can you recommend something else? 
And some colleagues were recommending cocktails, spirits that weren't there. But on the Geridon, there was actually a vermouth and a gin. So you could offer this vermouth or this gin tonic and actually serve it. So when you get your sparkling wine and you suddenly see, hmm, there's a bottle of vermouth right next to it, think about it. Probably there will be a vermouth coming up in the task. And also look really if there's several bottles and you're the last candidate or there are only a couple of candidates, some of these bottles will probably be the wrong bottle, either the wrong vintage, the wrong vineyard site, um, the wrong quality. And they might look very similar, but especially if you have very many bottles, one might be warm, one might be cold, really look at what you have and work like you would in a restaurant, making really, really sure you bring the guest what they asked for. And that's very, very important. At the same time, it's important to um, prepare things you say. If in that moment you're tasting a wine and then need to come up with a food recommendation, you probably will not have the time. So make sure before you go into a competition that you have a lot of wines on the top of your mind and a lot of food that you can immediately say the same for teas, coffees, uh, chocolates you might want to recommend. Make sure you have all this ready because it will be a very stressful situation and you need to say it very, very quickly and elegantly. And also explain why you are recommending this. For example, don't say I'm recommending this cognac because it's a sponsor, but say I'm recommending this cognac because it has this beautiful history of this and would go really well with your uh, chocolate pralines in the end, which are from. <laughs> Think about where is the competition happening? For example, in Kyoto for the best sommelier of Asia, there was um, a question, can you please make us a menu only with Southeast Asian food? And of course, it's an Asian uh, oceanic competition, so it makes sense to prepare some dishes that come from that area. So that's very, very important to have that ready when you are uh, on stage. Another thing is, um, I always like to quote Sören Polonius from Sweden. The timing you get is like a million dollars you win in a lottery. If you want to buy a car for $500,000, you will probably not throw the other $500,000 away. So it's the same with the timing. If you get a task and it takes three minutes, but you're finished after two, don't say, thank you, I'm finished. Use the time as much as you can. Double check whether you really remember to say everything. Did you identify all the beverages as closely as possible? Is there maybe a chance to give a second food option? Is there maybe the chance to recommend at which temperatures or which glasses you could do this? Um, think about what you would do in a normal restaurant setting if it's a quiet service and you still have time left with a guest. You're probably not just going to leave him sitting there. You're going to try to engage in some small talk, maybe uh, do a little bit of upselling. If you already sort on the wines to the menu, maybe you want to get your digestive trolley. That kind of mindset will help you also in the practical parts of a sommelier competition because we want to see people that are really part of our job and doing a great job for the guests. And that's very, very important. And when you look at competitions online, you will see best practices. You will see certain colleagues that are finished um, with the table and it might not have been the best table they did in that final, but they will switch off immediately and be bright and shining for the next table. And that's very important. If you did a mistake on one table, you immediately need to forget about it and concentrate to 120% on the next table because that way you can perform even better. If you are doing the decanting table while you're still thinking about what you messed up on the sparkling table, you will probably do even more mistakes on the decanting table and will be like a snowball effect throughout your entire final or throughout your entire semi-final. It's important to stay in that mindset, to really be positive and to take each chance as new chance um, and not to think about what happened or did I maybe not do well in the theory paper this morning now that I'm doing the tasting. Once you finish the theory paper, the theory paper is gone. Focus on tasting, focus on service. And that's very, very important to remember. And this leads me to the last part, the mental preparation. Many people forget about this. They sit at home, they taste, they meet up with their friends and practice service, they read theory, but it is really, really stressful to be in a sommelier competition. I mean, all of us are grown adults and many of us lead a team at work, but then suddenly you come in a sommelier competition and there are 30 people watching you with a clipboard and a timer in their hand and looking really stern while next to you there are 50 cameras clicking and a YouTube live stream and you have to focus only on those three guests in front of you. And that is a stressful situation. Sitting down to do a theory exam or to do a written tasting note, that's really, really stressful. So it's important to make sure you prepare yourself for that feeling. 
And you can do that by looking up sports plus psychology, by speaking to colleagues that are high class sportsmen, um, by speaking to people that are working in medicine. And these people have a lot of techniques and these techniques are out on your online, are out in libraries and books that can help you learn about yourself and how to deal with stress. And then quickly you will learn about things like meditation, things like breathing technique, things like how do I need to stand to calm myself down? And those are very, very important to remain elegant and to remain smooth while you do your service. And they will help you in your everyday life too. Um, and especially in a big competition, it can be very stressful because you need to wait a long time. So for example, I usually work dinner service, so I get up late. In a competition, I often need to get up at 6 a.m., then go to the competition at 8 a.m., but my first task is not till 12 or uh, 1 p.m. So I have five hours being locked up somewhere with loads of other crazy nervous candidates, and I need to make sure I don't become crazy and nervous myself. So it's important to become like a very quiet person and to find out what's good for you and to really learn how you can meditate and become calm, but then in the right moment, get out all the energy you need and be focused on the spot. Because in a big competition, often your service or your theory um, or the tasting will add up to something like 50 or 60 minutes in the first round. That means you spend one or two years preparing for those 50 or 60 minutes. So it's very important to make sure that you do everything possible to be on point in those 50 to 60 minutes. And that's very, very important to get inspiration from other people that go through stressful situations. At the same time, it's important to be confident. You need to believe in the possibility that you can win this, but not to be overly confident. And that's very difficult. I know of people that have passed the master sommelier exam because they wrote on their mirror, I am a master sommelier, weeks before they passed the exam because they wanted to get in that mindset. And that's, I think, a good approach to do. But you need to make sure that you still stay humble enough and self-critical enough that you don't overdo it. But you need to believe in yourself that you did the best preparation possible. You are on the top of your uh, form and that you are ready to win this thing. And that's very, very important. And I will never forget, we spoke at Som360 with an Olympic sportsman who, when he had a panic attack the day before the competition, he wrote himself a list. I know I'm in a good physical condition. I know I practiced every day. I know this slope. So he was reassuring himself that he had done a good preparation to really make sure he stays calm when then the gates open, the cameras shine on him and he needs to run down the hill with his skis. And that's very, very important. And that leads me to the very last point, which is how do you deal with the day and the week itself, depending on how long the competition is. It's important that you go to bed early enough because probably you're not going to sleep well and probably you will need to get up early. It's important that you do enjoy your time. You will be meeting many people from all over the world or from different parts of your country and there will probably be nice wines from nice sponsors to enjoy and it's good to do that but to make sure you know when to stop enjoying the wines. Um, that also. It's important to eat healthy and make sure you have it because many people when they are nervous they don't eat but you need a lot of energy but think about what you eat and what you drink. You might not want to have a big tzatziki with a lot of garlic the night before you have a tasting exam. You might probably not want to have a strong espresso and a cigar the morning of your tasting exam. Um, so really also before the exam, get into that routine. In a week leading up to competition, I would always get up early. At the same time, judging by the schedule, I would expect to have to get up on that day. I would always eat the same things. Like for me, it was a certain tea, a certain kind of breakfast. I would always be in the same routine to make sure when the game day comes, I'm in that routine. And it's not that it's the only time this week where I have to get up early. I try to really get into that routine. That also means that if the competition is in a different time zone, you try to make sure you get there a couple of days early so you can get rid of the jet lag. Something we probably don't have to worry about too much at the moment, but we'll come back soon. Um, then it's important to have your stuff ready. Um, there's so much you need to take with you. There's a waiter's knife, there's a pen, there's matches for decanting, there's maybe a second napkin, and make sure you have that all laid out for you the night before, or at least uh, the day before you travel, because then it's probably difficult to get afterwards. And make sure it's always in the same spot. So the last practices you do, make sure it's in the same costume or the same jacket that you'll be wearing on that day. 
uh, so you immediately know where everything is. Make sure you have those things double because we've seen it in many finals. The first task is opening, let's say, a Coke or a tonic for an aperitif. People forget to put their waiter's knife back in their pocket. They come to the counting table and they don't have a waiter's knife. It's important to always have two bottle openers, two pens, two pieces of paper, two napkins. Try to pack as much as anything. I know I always feel like MacGyver when I walk into a competition. And yes, the suit probably has loads of bumps it should not have, but at least I know I have everything I need to do my job. And that's very, very important. And important is also, I would always recommend getting up early, having breakfast, then dressing, because you don't want to um, spill the yogurt from your breakfast on your black suit, which you then need an hour later, because that would be stress you don't need on that day. Um, and also to do a written blind tasting in your room once you are dressed. Why? Because first of all, then your uh, mouth tastes already like wine and not like uh, morning yogurt or morning toothpaste. So you will be fresh when you get the first wine from the exam and you already will be in that structure. So I would buy myself in the hotel or in the supermarket next to the hotel two easy wines that didn't need to be anything complicated and do myself a written tasting in the morning before I walk into the exam so that I'm already primed and ready once I get the paper and can start writing. And last but not least, um, think about the whole week, what's happening. And an example I like to give is in Belgium, one of the key sponsors was a local brewery, De Koning, and they have a great brewery. And there were six stations, a chocolate place, a cheese place, a meat place, and two beer places. And we were split up into groups and in each group, there were two best sommeliers of the world. And we would all be joking around, having a great time this evening, 30 minutes in each station, and was all very relaxed. But in the two beer stations, where they then showed us how to pour one of their beers from a bottle and tap one of their beers, you could see that the best sommeliers of the world were moving to the front and were watching very, very closely what, what's happening in the front, unlike at the cheese or the chocolate or the ham. So if you pay a little bit of attention, that would make sense that that probably came up later in the week. And yes, when we walked into the finals, we were asked to tap a beer, just like we had been taught five days earlier. That was a social night out, part of the official program, but there was a key information there. And that's so important to pick up all these little hints. If there's a tasting offered by the sponsors, maybe go there and taste. It might not be the same wine as in the exam, but it will help you to taste. So it's important to really look at the whole official program, not only at the exams, and look at what could be a good thing that could really come up, or it's just nice for you to know for your everyday life. And that would be uh, my finishing words, to remember that the competition is not a completely uh, crazy thing. It's trying to resemble what we do every day. And it's trying to help us when we prepare to become a better sommelier every day. And that's the key mindset I would like all of you to take when you prepare for competition. It's not for the competition, it's for your everyday life and will thus last for many years and decades afterwards. So thank you very much for listening so far, if I And now I'm really curious to hear all your questions. First of all, Mark, uh, thank you so much for giving us all these great insights. It's really incredible to understand what you have to take into account before you step on the stage. It is just like a, a huge booklet of, of things you have to think about. And having a maître looking on your fingers uh, during everyday service um, is a real advantage. Thank you, Aurélien, for doing so. That was for sure a fantastic help for Mark uh, yeah, preparing for the World uh, Championship. So. I'll begin with the first questions I, I found, or e even the first questions, maybe also to understand a little bit more about your your way into the, the business. When you started working in the hospitality industry, was your vision already to become a sommelier, or was that only later? Um, I first wanted to become a physicist, and then I found that physics is quite dry and involves a lot of math, something I wasn't very good at. Um, so I thought, okay, I like languages and I like to travel. So I wanted to um, become uh, a hotel specialist and did a training for that in Cologne, in my home country. And then I noticed during that, okay, wine is really nice. It's going to be a great topic um, as a hobby. 
but I want to become a hotel manager. And again, I noticed, okay, that's a lot of math and not as much fun as wine and being part of a restaurant. And then I switched and became a sommelier and started in the Rheingau. Um, and there was a beautiful place to learn about wine close to all those iconic Riesling um, producers of the world. And that was really, really fun to do. Yeah, um, but as far as I remember, um, you know, we, we have two major sommelier degrees in Germany, one of the Chamber of Commerce and the other one um, of the stately approved sommelier. Uh, did you go through one of these trainings or how did you do your first steps? Um, I was very lucky that early on I was introduced to the German Somni Association and they have a great uh, junior training program as it was called at the time. Now it's just a training program and they offer a lot of um, possibilities to travel um, to wine regions to uh, have great teachings twice a year with very motivated colleagues from across the country and great uh, mentors from the business. So I did that very early on. And then later on, I did um, the Court of Masters formulas. I started doing it. I uh, passed the first three levels, so introductory, certified, and advanced. Um, but that's quite self-taught. There aren't that many official uh, classes for that. Um, so I was trying to get my information from all kinds of events, from suppliers inviting you to travel somewhere, from um, general tastings, from lectures at the ProVine, um, from internet to piece and puzzle together from all those different offers available. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is uh, for sure uh, incredible work you have done, but maybe even uh, more in-depth because by having to look for all the information yourself, Uh, you memorize it even more in depth than if you just get it served. Yes, uh, that's the same thing like with the flashcards. I always think it's good if you get information and then you need to um, redigest it yourself in a way that helps you remember it. Um, and that's why it's important to not take granted information, but do it yourself and uh, really structure it in the way that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a nice question from Marcos, our friend from uh, Mexico. Um, what's the next challenge for you, my friend? Well, I think the biggest challenge at the moment is shared by all of us and trying to find how we can make a good beverage program in these very challenging conditions we have around the world at the moment. Um, so, for example, we just recently opened a cinema and I had to write a wine list for a cinema, which is something I haven't done before. Um, so it's important that we adapt to the new situation as best possible. But in terms of... Um, learning. I think a sommelier should never stop learning and all the great sommeliers I look up to and admire, um, like for example Serge Stubes or Marcos Del Monego, they are always learning, even though they are beyond 50 and 60 in age, but they are learning every day and I think that's very important. Um, and I'm still trying to do the master sommelier exam um, and I still have to pass theory and tasting for that. Oh, so that's a, a huge challenge you're facing also. Um, When we went to Antwerp uh, last year, yeah, it was last year, it's just 15 month, months ago, something like that, um, our common goal was to reach the semifinals. No, that you reached the semifinals, uh, what you did. Uh, at what point did you feel that there might be a chance to reach even more? Um, I think what you said is we is very important because, like I said, this is never a single effort. It's always a team effort. There was this training group of uh, Joe Wessels, um, of all the friends from Germany, like Maximian Wilm, who is here, of Karin Patrizio, and all of those that would help me with information, with training together, with tasting together. Um, and, of course, my coaches, uh, Frank Kemmer, and also the German Somni Association with you, Per. And it is really a real feeling. And it's important to take strength in that also from the colleagues at work that are watching through WhatsApp and live videos and all of that. Um, and then I always wanted to come in the semifinals because I thought, okay, that's a not unrealistic goal, but it's um, also quite a high goal. And I said, okay, I want to set my goal high. Uh, and then when we, uh, I came to the semifinal, I was really, really happy. Um, and I thought, okay, this is a great training for the European Cup um, because there were so many amazing zombies there. Um, and I thought, okay, it's a really, really tough competition. And it's a great way to learn from these others by watching how they go through this week. And um, there was the cruelest part of the whole week was when we were all lined up, all 19, and one per one had to take their seat that didn't make it to the finals. Um, and honestly, until there were only three of us left, I did not think that I would not be taking my seat. So it was really that moment. 
I remember that your father was calling a day before saying, come on, I'm going to sit into the, the car and drive all the way uh, to, to Antwerp to, to see you in the final. And you just told him, oh, no, no, you will see me three minutes up there. Yes, um, that is true. He called me because he said probably the next competition won't be that close to Germany. So it might be a good chance to see you. And I said, there's no chance you're going to see me in the final and if it's going to be live on online. Uh, but I don't think it's worth the drive. And then afterwards, he was a bit mad. Um, but he did come to Zurich a day later and then he celebrated. Hmm. That's great to hear. Yeah. Um, there's another nice question from Andreas. Uh, no, it was from Frances Francesco. Um, are you going to compete again? Uh, no. Uh, definitely not. Uh, I'm actually, to be honest, I'm very happy uh, on one side because it is a lot of work to prepare. Um, but on the other side, um, I also miss it a little bit. I miss the adrenaline kick and the few places I have now sat in the jury of a competition. I really feel the adrenaline of the candidates um, and I can feel how, how st uh, stressful it is. Um, but I think um, after the World Cup, it's, there's not many other competitions um, that are similar in structure. So I prefer to help people prepare. Um, I prefer to do things like this and um, to more do exams still, but not so much the competition side. I think it's uh, good if we help many people from across the world gather the knowledge they need to do it themselves now. And there was another great question um, talking about tasting. How do you decide your final conclusion when you probably you have too many options in your mind? Um, that is very, very true. And I think it's important, um, the biggest mistake all of us do when we blind taste is we always try to think what it is we're tasting. But the key question should not be what is it, but what is it not? If it has that kind of tannin, it cannot be this wine. If it has that kind of color, it cannot be this wine. And that way, as you go through your structure, you always have things you dish out during the way. And then you usually you're only left with two or three things. And what I try to do is I try to recap the key points for the wine myself and then try to say, okay, this and this and this will probably lead me in this direction. But it is always a gamble. I mean, tasting is the most difficult thing probably all of us do in a competition and probably also the one where most people score lowest in identification, actually. And I think it's important to know that um, it's not that bad if you get it wrong. Um, I always like to say in the semifinals, there was a Cabernet from China. And even everybody said it's Cabernet, but I think nobody said it's from China. Um, so it's important to focus on what those things you know for certain and try to do your best guess. Um, the English have a great uh, definition for an estimate. It's an educated guess. And I think that's the best thing to describe a tasting. Yeah, that reminds me of what uh, Frank Kemmer is always saying, that uh, you should describe the, the wine in your normal routine and then don't touch the glass again and then make your decision. Yeah, absolutely. You should really just go through the key points you said yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so far I don't see new questions coming in. I'm also looking on the Facebook uh, pages, but I don't see more questions coming in for the moment. So. Ah, there is one from Manuel. Do you have any way to study about tea or cigars? Um, yes. These kind of things are a bit difficult because there are not always perfect um, sources out there. For tea, um, there are some good books. I'm trying to remember the name. Um, uh, I'll try to think of it and come back to you. Um, but it's also a good way to speak with your suppliers because many great tea suppliers have really good tea academies or tea leaflets or tea websites, and they can help you with information, usually for free. And the same with cigars. If you work in a country that has great um, cigar culture uh, and deliveries, go to them or go to the big companies like Davidoff, for example. They usually have an online learning tool or they have a booklet, which is quite uh, intense and you can read that. There is a little bit out on Guildsom too, on tea and cigars, but not that much. Um, and again, it's important to think about what kind of question could come up. For tea, it will often be a tasting or identification question. It might be something on what kind of plant or what kind of abbreviations, because in many things we study, it's about, can you read the label? So if there's on a tea bag TGFOP, that might be something you would be asked in the exam, explain TGFOP. Um, it might be that you get asked, where is this from? Can you explain origins? Do you know in which country of the world Darjeeling is, for example, or Assam, um, and what differentiates them? 
And can you explain this to a guest? The same with the cigar. Of course, there's so many cigars out there, but what is the key thing you could get asked? The key thing is what are the common shapes? What are the common brands? Um, what is the meaning of a ring gorge? Um, so how thick a cigar is? What does that tell you numerically, but also about the length or the taste of the cigar? What are the different parts of a cigar? So try asking yourself the questions um, a client could ask you in the restaurant. If you're standing with him in front of a humidor, how is he going to make his decision? He will probably tell you, I need a lighter cigar. Or I need a cigar which um, only burns for 20 minutes. So you need to know what information the cigars or the labels of the cigar tell you to do that. And that kind of thing will probably be what you will be asked in an exam or competition. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just getting through a question which came up in my mind because most of the international um, competitions, uh, you always have to speak not in your mother tongue. So do you also do all your training in the language you will choose? Yes, especially the tasting. Um, you should train in the language you're going to do in the competition. So um, for those that don't know, in an ASI competition, it needs to be a foreign language for yourself um, and it needs to be English, French or Spanish. So if you're from France, you can only do it in English or Spanish. If you're like me from Germany, you could choose English, French or Spanish. My Spanish is non-existent. My French is quite okay, but my English is definitely my strongest language. So I would do it in that. And I would try to also write down all the information whilst revising in English. So then when I get the question, I immediately relate it to the right thing and don't spend time translating. And um, there's some more questions here. How do you organize all this information? Um, like I said, I'm very black and white. I do uh, Excel sheets and I do flashcards. I don't work with colors or maps that much. Um, although it is important, there's need always a map in a question and it's also something that's nice to know, but I struggle a bit with memorizing that. And I really try to stay current. For example, there, there's always this question, there's a picture of a famous winemaker or a famous chateau or a famous Grand Cru. So every time I was reading Decanter or something else and there was a picture of someone who I thought hmm, that might come up, I took that picture, put it in a PowerPoint, made the same slide again and wrote the name or the answer to it. So I had loads of lists, loads of PowerPoints of information that I was collecting and then transforming into flashcards and mock exams. And um, do you do the most difficult that probably you don't have too much information? I usually do the things I struggle to remember early on and then again, very close to the exam. For example, I don't work a lot with wines from Eastern Europe. Um, and it's a language I don't speak, Czech or Slovakian. Or, um, so it's something I struggle to remember. So it's something I will keep um, revising every now and again, but especially leading up to the exam. Whereas I work a lot with Bordeaux. So it's probably something I don't need to spend a lot that, that much time on revising because I know the wines better. So it's important to know what are your own weaknesses compared to what you work with every day. And there was another question, what was the most difficult task you had in a competition? Um, I think the general big, big difficulty in a competition is we are all great sommeliers, but keeping your cool, keeping your nerves and being able to put that on in the right moment, that's probably the biggest challenge. So it's important you really focus on that mental preparation and staying calm. For example, there was this moment um, in Antwerp. I did not know that Jensis Robinson would be part of the jury. So I did my first two tasks and then suddenly there's Jensis Robinson standing in front of me reading a task to me and I was so baffled. I was like, oh my God, there's Jensis Robinson and I didn't listen to the task. So I had to, uh, to repeat it when she gave me the red wine to taste. Um, so it's important that you really stay calm no matter what happens. Um, well, there's also this moment where I was approaching the table and Paolo Basso looks at me really sternly and sends me away again because there was a mark on the floor where I had to stand, but I hadn't seen it. Um, and to then not get that make you nervous because the uh, best song of the world just send you away somewhere. Um, so it's very important to really stay calm. But in terms of a single task, um, I think as for many, tasting is the most difficult. Um, and to me, it's especially tasting spirits because um, I did train it a lot and it did help me get better, but I don't drink spirits very often. Um, I usually drink wine or sometimes beer or other stuff. Um, and that's why it's more difficult for me to identify spirits. Yes. Well, so are there more questions coming in? So just write them into the chat, please. Or on, on Facebook, uh, you can also write the questions. So far, I don't see further questions, but 
we are already uh, almost finished. And for me, it is really impressive to see how many people from so many different continents are, are joining us here for the session. So we have people from Japan, from United Kingdom, from Denmark, from Cyprus and Germany for sure too, but also from Canada, from Switzerland, uh, from yeah, Albania, Australia, Bulgaria, Brazil, um, really from all over the world. And this is um, really a, a great um, thing to see that so many people are interested in, in what you are saying. And there are more questions coming in. Any tips when something goes wrong during the final? Um, like I said, I spent a lot of time watching YouTube um, and looking at other finals, and there are very many out there, um, and I learned a lot from that. And um, one I can really recommend is watching the last final from the Best Sommelier of Americas, um, because Pierre Alexis Soulier, who won in the end, um, did two great things. He did many great things, but two that really impressed me. One is Pierre Alexis is a master sommelier, so he's used to this quite structured tasting which is different to the way you might taste an exam where you're supposed to speak like speaking to a guest in most exams, depending on how the question is phrased. And he does a beautiful mix of the two styles of um, tasting in a very structured way, but also tasting in a way that's fun to listen to and not just like a Robert going through structure. And uh, why am I thinking of him? Uh, on, I think the first task, they had to prepare drinks and he went about the cocktail in completely the wrong way. And he noticed that halfway through and then he, noticed, looked at the guests and said, I'm awfully sorry, I should have shaked this instead of building it or something along those lines. I will restart again. And then I think he even offered a small complimentary snack or something. So he did it like in a restaurant, you would admit that there was a mistake going wrong. And then you um, just continue and try to still do it in the proper time without keeping guests waiting too long and being honest and being charming. And it's really great to see um, how he handles that situation in that particular final. And um, it's important that if things go wrong and you can still change them, change them. For example, once I had to do a cocktail in the Best Sommelier of Germany competition and I forgot to put ice in it. And I had served the cocktail and I was like, darn, I should have put some ice in this. Um, and then I still had some seconds left. So I offered them a glass with ice and a spoon on the side. Of course, I probably lost some points, but they could see that I had tried to solve the situation. And I guess, or I hope that scored me some points. And I think it's very important to think like that. And if you really can't save it anymore, um, then, like I said, just get on with it. There is always the next task. But if you keep thinking about the mistake you just did, you will do more mistakes. So um, the moment the task is finished, try to make sure you think about it's finished. Because in a competition, you really need to uh, stay in that moment and think about what's happening in this very moment. Um, and I think many people can relate. If you are in a final, you are usually the last three of 20 or 50 or 60, depending on the competition. And of course you start thinking about, well, hey, what might happen if I win this? I get a really cool prize and a gift there, and then we do a party. But that's really the last thing you should be thinking about. So um, when I was waiting for the final, I was the last uh, candidate. Um, so I had the longest wait. I was trying to suppress those thoughts and just try to go through, okay, what could be possible tasks. Do I have all my menus ready to say? Do I have all my wines ready to say? Um, okay, there was this setup with the beer fridge and the beer tap. How did this go again? Um, if they're asking for a beer and a cocktail, in which order would I do it? That kind of thing to remember um, what happened in other competitions and to stay focused on the moment and not on the future. Then there was a question, um, how do you find to calibrate your tasting for CMS versus competitions? Do you use the same tasting grid or do you change it? Um, the key difference between CMS, WSET, and the competition is CMS and WSET, there is a tasting grid. Um, for competitions, um, because every competition has a different organizer, um, you don't know which tasting grid they're going to use. So it might be a good idea to look at what kind of judges are there. Um, if it's a competition where you have only four MS in the jury, like for example, Shane Rott is your competition, then probably, I don't know, I'm assuming, um, they will grade you close to the CMS grid. Um, if it is a mix of MWs, MS, sponsors, local um, famous sommeliers, then it's a bit difficult to say what will they focus on. So it's important to get in all the possible structures, look at how the CMS tastes, how does WSET taste, how have people tasted that have won finals of other competitions, um, and try to build your own structure out of that. 
and make it sound in an elegant and fun way. Because I think it's also very important to remember, um, you need to think about the guy who's marking you. Um, for example, in the World Cup, we were 66 candidates. So they would see the same thing, whether it's the service or theory or tasting for 66 times. And often they would see it with messy handwriting or with things going wrong. So you need to make sure you think for them. So in a written tasting, maybe don't just write a full essay, but write a small subheader. This is the part where I look at the appearance, then the nose, then the palate, and the conclusion. So they have it easier to mark. The same when you're tasting, orally, tell them which wine you're tasting. Wine one is this and this and this. Now I'm going to wine two, because they need to have time to jump with their pen on their marking board. And that's very important that you think about, they need to have the time to give you the point. Um, and that's why it's good if you build your own structure, with it, which is adaptable to many judges and many competitions. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you so much. For the moment, uh, I see a lot of uh, thanks coming in uh, through the chat and also through the social media uh, channels. Um, I mentioned quite some, some countries who are with us right now. I did not mention all of them yet. We also have people from Macau, Mexico, Norway, Philippines, Serbia, Russian Federation, Slovenia and United States of America. So you really see this is highly international through all the time zones and it's a great, great uh, th thank you to you, Mark, that you take your time for helping all the songs out there to prepare for the next competition. My pleasure. I'm really happy to see that so many people are happy to compete and happy to, by that, improving our, our profession because it's what we all do together. And I think it's important that we see um, more sommeliers out there. The chefs have done a great job of taking the spotlight. Um, and I think that's good because it's put restaurant in the spotlight. But now we need to explain to people um, what does the sommelier do. And uh, I think if we do a great job in competitions, it will help us create friendships across the globe, but it will also help us to um, really show the world what sommeliers can do and how important they are to our industry, even in a challenging time like this. And that's why I'm really happy to see so much interest in the topic of a competition, because like I said, it's not about the competition, it's about the learning points and meetings you do in the preparation and in the competition itself. So I wish all of you the best um, for your next preparations. And there was just a quick question now from Marcos. How many people were involved? Well, counting all the guests at the restaurant, it's a lot, um, but also the entire team from um, the restaurant, the Somni Association, my family, my friends. Um, it's very, very a big team. And I'm sure I would forget somebody, but you really need a team of support and people cheering and sending you WhatsApp in the morning. Good luck. Um, so it's impossible to say, but there were easily dozens. So thank you. I, I remember your smartphone the next morning uh, showing 800 and what uh, 870 what's unread WhatsApp messages, um, yes. and you were lucky that you were not uh, on on uh, social media platforms. Yes, <laughs> I felt very lucky in that respect too. Yes, it was quite <laughs> funny seeing the phone after it being taken away from you for hours. It was funny to see that. I did a screenshot and I will never delete that. Yes. Okay, maybe Joe just wants to say a few words. Well, Mark, definitely it was a great presentation. And uh, I think you have motivated a lot of people. I think a lot of people uh, which have seen the, from all over the world, uh, they'd be more eager now to join competitions. Um, here we don't have age restriction because I'm almost motivated myself to get into competitions now. But it's great. It's a, it's a great presentation. I will say that again. And uh, all the best uh, to all the future candidates. And I'm sure today's presentation uh, uh, will actually show them uh, a, a bit better the way of how to prepare for the competition. Excellent, Mark. Thank you, Per. Thanks, everybody, for uh, participating and watching this webinar. Yes. And if you want to re-see it again, uh, you can go to the uh, Facebook page of SISOMS, of the Cypriot uh, Sommelier Association, or to the uh, Facebook page of the German Sommelier Association. There you can see the recording. So it will be there all the time uh, because it's. I think it's always nice if you can watch it again to see. And I just opened uh, the possibility to switch on your microphones if you just want to make a short uh, shout out and 
Say uh, thank you. Before anybody says anything, Per, can I just say something? Yeah, sure. I've uh, before this presentation, we officially sent a letter to Aziboard that uh, the competition is going ahead in November. Uh, Cyprus restrictions are all almost uh, very few to go prevent a competition. We just pray that uh, all the rest of the world will be also be like Cyprus very soon, and uh, or we won't have by November any problems with the borders, and everybody will be here in Cyprus. So many of you, we hope to see you in Cyprus. Okay. Thank you, Per. Everybody can make any questions now they wish. Thank you for the invitation, Yoyos, and I look forward to seeing you in Cyprus in November. Yeah, we're all looking forward to going to Cyprus, uh, seeing a lot of you. And yeah, thank you so much for all your time. Thank you, Stalo and Georges, for this great teamwork, Cy Cyprus and, and Germany. Uh, thank you for all the guests being with us and see you soon again and stay safe. Bye-bye to everybody. Bye-bye.